Hello everyone. Uh, good afternoon for some, maybe good morning still. Uh, but great to have you on our webinar today about employee engagement. Um, a topic that I personally feel uh, very much attracted to as I'm uh, a founder of a company myself. I have a team and I'm also active in HR. Uh, a really interesting topic. And especially I think in the era in which we are living now uh, and in 2022. Um, before I'm going to tell you what's on the agenda today, and I've, I'm of course going to uh, also let everyone here in the call introduce themselves, um, I wanted to briefly explain why it's so important to focus on employee engagement. Um, at the moment, 54% uh, of all European employees actually feel disengaged at work. Uh, and I think in this war for talent, as we all know, uh, if people feel less engaged, they're more tend to leave the company. It uh, decreases your productivity at the work for, um, it has a huge impact on mental well-being and I think mental well-being fortunately is a topic that becomes more urgent uh, compared to a couple of years ago. Um, so it's an important one, but it's also, it tends to be quite an intangible topic for a lot of companies. And I think we've also seen that in the number of subscriptions today, uh, so really great to see the interest there. What we will discuss today is a couple of topics. Uh, first, we will um explain how to get started with MP engagement what do you uh, how do you measure it how do you keep track of it what are the indicators whether it's going well or whether it's not going so well also of course what do we understand when what do we mean with employee engagement i think employee engagement covers a lot of different components uh, and i think each of us maybe has a preference or maybe a top three on hey what is what is most important when it comes to employee engagement uh, we are going to talk about useful tooling and strategies to improve it. Uh, and last but not least, the role of diversity, equality and inclusion on employee engagement. Um, my name is Charlotte. I am uh, one of the founders of eCulture, which is an HR tech startup based in Rotterdam in the Netherlands. Uh, and what we do is we help companies uh, make unbiased hiring decisions by gamifying the hiring process. So instead of letting people apply with a resume, we let candidates complete a couple of neuroscientific games that allow them to showcase their skills, their talents, their cultural preferences, and so on. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, we are a team of 30 people ourselves now, planning to grow to 60. So employee engagement is also for me personally is a topic that is really important here. And also, to be fair, something relatively new for me. So really looking forward to learn from you guys as well today. Uh, I have three amazing panelists today. Uh, instead of me introducing them, I think you're always best at introducing yourself. Uh, so Lexi, I, uh, I want to start with you. Uh, hi everyone, good morning. My name is Lexi Papasviru and I'm the Chief Operating Officer of the Tech Talent Charter. The Tech Talent Charter um, is an industry collaborative not-for-profit. We're, um, we're funded by the UK government and our intention is to try and make the tech economy of the UK a more diverse and inclusive place. We do that by working with some 600 and growing uh, UK-based organisations with a tech footprint in the UK and we provide free resources to help those companies with their diversity and inclusion efforts. Great, thank you. Andy, would you like to take over? Sure. Um, I'm Andy Bibby. I'm the CEO of 87%. We are a company that focuses on mental health. So we've developed a, an ecosystem that allows companies and the people who work within it to measure, understand and improve their mental health. Measurement is key for us because it allows us to personalize and, and to help organizations really understand where to start and we know that mental health and engagement are tightly connected we also know that mental health diversity inclusion all of those strategies that you have are tightly connected so if you can measure mental health then you you're really on your way to to really understanding how to engage with each entity within your organization as a separate entity rather than taking a sort of one size fits all approach, which as organizations grow, it, it just simply doesn't uh, work as effectively as, as something more tailored. Cool, thank you. And uh, last but not least, we have Robin. And uh, to give the credit to you, Robin, uh, you, of course, uh, you, of course, uh, managing director at Spinx. I'm not going to introduce you now, uh, but Spinx is the partner that we are organizing this webinar with. Uh, and you guys came up with the topic of employee engagement and, and emphasized the urgency of the topic. Uh, so credits to Spinx for uh, getting this event organized. And uh, I hand it over to you now, Robin. 
Thank you, Charlotte. Yes, I'm Managing Director of Spinks. Uh, Spinks is part of the Harvey Nash Group. They're a very large international staffing and technology business. And within that group, Spinks is the brand that focuses on the startup scale-up play space. Um, that's across UK and continental Europe. Um, employee engagement, um, Charlotte, just as you, as you said, is so, so important. A, for us, we're scaling, we're growing, you know, we're moving into Amsterdam and Berlin ourselves. And we're looking at at, at the scale of ourselves but equally it's so important for the founders and ceos that we speak to on a, on a daily basis um it really is if you get employee engagement right your company will grow and if you don't it, it won't so that's why we kind of really want to come to you with the topic today yeah and i uh, i couldn't agree more um one practical note before we dive into uh the actual topics topics around employee engagement uh there is a chat functionality here in the tool there's also a questions uh tab if you have any questions for um uh, one of the panelists or if you have a comment that you would like to discuss here feel free to put it in the chat or in the questions tab um i will try to keep track of that during the webinar uh, to squeeze in the questions that are relevant for the conversation now and of course we will have a Q&A at the end as well. Um, so before diving into how to measure employee engagement, where to start, I think uh, also for me personally employee engagement is quite a, tends to be quite a buzzword, like we all talk about it, but it can be quite intangible to Really say, hey, what is employee engagement? What components does it cover? What what makes employee engagement within your organization? So, maybe uh, Roman, I wanted to start with you. Um, what would you say are the most crucial components of employee engagement, or what is it that that pops up into your mind when you think about employee engagement? It, it's an interesting perspective, actually, that Charlotte, because you talk about it being a, a buzzword, so it's maybe more of a, a word on trend right now. Um, but I think also companies are thinking much more about their employees now. You know, um, I certainly feel we're doing a lot more within Spinks and also within the wider Harvey Nash group to think about employees. So what does it mean to me? It, it, it really means that we are we are thinking about our employees all the time and we're thinking about how we do engage and connect with our employees. We're making sure that our employees well-being and mental health is, is paramount to us as a business. Um, but we're also thinking about how we we create careers, I think, for our employees. And that's a big part, I think, for me about that employee engagement. They're not just here to support the business's growth. We actually, in return, have to support their growth, give them the right nutrients to be able to grow as well. As well. So that, that's what employee engagement means to me. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Hey, Andy, what I think is interesting with regards to employee engagement is the mental well-being component, and uh, you know all about it. Um, would you agree with me if I'm saying that if you compare it to, I don't know, 10 to 5 years ago, and mental well-being, employee well-being um, has significantly increased in terms of urgency for companies? I have the feeling that that's uh, maybe that is also something to do with COVID, uh, but that we tend to have way more focus on mental well-being than we used to have a couple of years ago. Yeah, no doubt. We started thinking about this in 2016. We did some work in 2017 and we actually formally launched the organization in 2018 and we've been collecting data since because we're a, we, we deal with a lot of data and insight. So we, we've seen even over that time, attitudes to, to mental health change. And the pandemic really forced organizations to think about it. And, and we actually see ourselves in sort of a the third phase of it. In 2020, when the pandemic hit, very little budgets in place, not that many, uh, not, not kind of focused staff, and people scrambled, people were at home, they needed support. They were dealing with all sorts of, of, of issues in the home uh, and everybody was different and they were suddenly forced back to work from home and we saw companies scramble. Then in 2021, we saw a lot more organization. Uh, we saw budgets coming into place. We saw a headcount coming into place and that allowed people to take a more structured approach to mental health, mental well-being, which is tightly connected to engagement. Um, 
now where we are in, in kind of coming into 2022 is at least the clients we're working with, it's all about measurement. It's all about saying, well, actually, I'm spending all of this money. We're doing this. Is it working? Are people using the, the features that we put in place? Um, and so we're working with a lot of clients on understanding gender, age group differences, ethnicity, and, and how that's all coming out to play as the pandemic also is, you know, we're, we're coming into sort of end of year two into, uh, into year three. And when we think about engagement, and I think about it both as a CEO of, a, uh, of an organization and also the way in which we connect it to mental health, we think about it as, as caring. We want employees to care about the business and we want the business to care about the employees. And if you've got that relationship where I show I care about you and you show sure that you're caring about the business, then you've got true engagement because people are thinking about it. So that's how we define engagement. We think about it as, as caring. Um, and if you care for your employees and you show that you care for them in, in, in everything that they do, they will uh, give you back. Um, in terms of their engagement, their thinking, and they will show that they care in return. So that's kind of how we think about it. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I couldn't agree more. Lexi, anything um, uh, that has not been said about employee engagement up so far that you would like to add to that? Yeah, um, Andrew, I like what you were just saying there around like when you look at employee engagement, what does it mean? And when I think about it, particularly with the companies that we tend to talk to at Tech Talent Charter, um, engagement is kind of like a proxy in a way for two concepts, commitment and trust. And the relationship between employer and employee is obviously predicated on having really uh, like to have, have the best possible commitment and trust mutually between each other. And employee engagement is everything that goes into trying to facilitate having the best versions of commitment and trust between an employee and an employer. Um, and obviously, the reason why this is a really big business concern, if, if we just look at it from the point of view of, you know, what does the bottom line say? Um, if you have low commitment and low trust between an employee and employer, you are going to see higher um, higher attrition. You're going to see your attention is damaged. You're going to be spending more on recruitment. So this is a very real, like, there's a financial incentive for getting employee engagement right and there's also a good ethical and, and like responsible point that Andrew was making which is just that you know it's about caring for people and being a human I think more than anything we've seen in the last couple of years how important that is and actually that kind of outlook is is on the rise and that's great. Sure can I can I say something that? so Absolutely. it's really interesting actually um, Andrew because when we kind of set up, we've kind of set up very recently employee engagement surveys and doing more work around that side of things. And I think initially there was, it's not mistrust, but there was a different a bit of why are we suddenly doing this. But that element you talked about, the caring, I think if we had actually maybe described that at the at the outset of this is us caring, I think that would have would have translated very well. Because there is always understanding, why are you suddenly doing this? Why is this suddenly of interest when, you know, and, and we talked to a lot of, you know, Obviously, I talk to a lot of founders of startups and scale ups and their focus is 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 on so many different things, you know, in investment, getting the MVP out, everything else. But of course, employees have to be important. But I think that just that subject of caring is, is really is a good way to label it. Yeah, I try and think about it. People ask me, why did it get involved in the business? You know, why did we start the business? And I come down to a very personal story. I have two daughters. Um, who are just entering the workforce. And the reality is I don't want them working for a company who doesn't care about them, who is going to sweat them to the bone and then cast them aside. That is not what business is about, and it's not how I represent myself. And so I think about, because uh, I'm a technologist by training, I'm, I'm not a psychologist, I have no medical training at all, I, I know how to use technology. Um, and I wanted to say, okay, well, how could I use technology to make the workplace better, not just for my kids, but for everybody's kids, um, and, and really shine a light on the data and the importance of why organizations should care, and, and actually commitment and trust, Lexi, huge parts of that, and, and we see that right across. But why should you, because there's huge business benefits, we uh, talk about a, a concept called philanthropic capitalism, which is really about companies um, 
investing in the, in the societies that surround them and, and why that's a good thing. And, and, and so it's just all interconnected, but that's kind of why sort of caring is, is very personal to me because, you know, I, I, I want my daughters to be safe at work. Really cool. Hey, and um, you mentioned data, Andy. I think that's a nice bridge to the, the, the first topic uh, of our deep dive and employee engagement. I think that everything around um, people related manners in your organization start with measuring, knowing what's going on, knowing what's your, at least your starting point and where you would like to go to. Um, does any of you have experiences with certain tooling, strategies, activities? You already mentioned service, Robin, to get started with this, to, to uh, create an overview of how the organization is doing in terms of MP engagement. Uh, I, I don't mind taking that. Charlotte, we have an assessment platform, very easy. It talks to Lexi's point about, about trust. It it's actually can be completely anonymous. Um, and we take people through a, an, a, an, a, an assessment that gives them a score across 35 areas of, of their life, you know, work-life ban balance, anxiety, uh, depression, health, uh, so we get a very good picture. We look at that through the lens of demographics, and we're able to give organizations that starting point. Um, so you, you get that starting point. Each individual gets their own report, so they get something back. The organization, we have behavioral scientists look at it, and we give the organization just a, a heat map of where they are. Because if you know where you are, no matter what kind of initiatives you're doing, particularly if you're doing employee engagement, you can measure the result of that. I always say, look, you wouldn't go on a diet without stepping on the scales on day one. But our businesses often uh, go down roads of initiatives. They often do things without actually knowing where they started. And then the CEO says, how are we doing? And they scramble. And they go, oh, yeah, great. And they start to tell stories. But at the end of the day, what you want is that hard data. So we we have a tool um, that gives people that baseline. And, you know, uh, uh, of course, you know, I'm here to talk about employee engagement. But 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 anyone who wants to, to uh, just, you know, contact me, um, eight, seven percent, and, and we can talk about it. Cool. Thanks, Andy. Hey, Robin, what did you do? Because you said hey, we, we started with sending out a survey. Uh, did you ask people to, yeah. to rate certain aspects of the workforce? Or? So, yeah, we use a an HR platform called Hive HR. Mm -hmm. And we do a uh, employee engagement survey three times a year. And now that's globally across across the group. And then what we really, really focus on is obviously collecting that data and that's really useful for us as a senior leadership team to be able to understand how engaged our employees are feeling. You know, obviously that can translate then into how productive they are. But more importantly, the reason why we, we choose to only do it three times a year rather than four or six is because we actually really want to make meaningful actions from what they actually come up with. And actually, that was in our first survey, because we, Andrew, we actually did that. We, we wanted to do a, a base level of how do employees currently feel before we conduct any initiatives, any plans around, you know, making employee engagement uh, better and, and employee uh, culture really much better. We want to get a base level. And the, the, the concern that came up across the group was, will we be listened to will these be actioned will this you know yes we might be telling you these things but how much are you actually going to listen to that and i think that can be translated it's for our group but that can be translated to any business you know so we we now do a, a real lot of emphasis around actually making sure we are doing meaningful actions based on what we're hearing from our employees and that you know we're now three three surveys in and already that's changing so much. And one way we're noticing it is actually the uptake of people taking those surveys as well. You know, the, the, you know that, that that's coming up. So I think we're at about 75% where I think day one, it was around 30 something percent. Mm. So I think that is, is, a, is a good in, indicative of, of we're making progress. Yeah, and I think that's that's uh, extremely important. I hear a lot from, from uh well, friends that work at big corporates or whatever, like they would, they, we get a survey every quarter, we fill it in and, and 
we have a feeling that it's just getting a spreadsheet and that nothing basically happens with it. So I think it's indeed very good to be aware of, hey, if I'm asking my employees to take time to fill this in, then I should make that promise that I'm actually going to act up on the response. So yeah, I completely agree. Hey, uh, Robin, quick question for you, uh, because you work with uh, a lot of startups and scale-ups. Um, two questions actually, when do you usually see, so on which growth stage, uh, whether that's in terms of employees or whatever, do you usually see that people start, or the founding team or the management team starts caring a bit more about employee engagement? And do you think that that's often too late then? I think it's changing, Charlotte. I think we are, you know, and I think COVID has been an acceleration to that change, uh, or because I think founders are thinking much more about it at a much earlier stage than they had previously you know and i'm being very generalist here but you know maybe a couple of years back founders were thinking very much about as i say getting a product out to market getting employees in to help them on that product and actually maybe then looking at you know raising more investment you know along those lines i'm definitely seeing a significant change in their mindset now around when they should be thinking about employee engagement and it goes back to Lexi's point there, where there's a financial return on this. You know, yes, I generally believe they do care, but there is a financial return. We are in a, in a position, you know, we work with a lot of tech startups and scale ups, and particularly, particularly we place technologists in those organizations, which are in so much demand. So if companies aren't thinking about their employees at the outset, and I would say actually at the hiring stage, not even at the onboarding stage, then these these candidates have a lot of choice of where they can go. Um, yeah. And they will they will vote with their feet and they won't go and take those at companies. So I, I think partly there's a financial perspective on it. But equally, I do think there's a generally there's a better th thought from a lot of these founders. A lot of these founders are younger in, in any way. And they're just thinking a little bit more about how important employee engagement is. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I like the fact that you touched up on the the hiring aspect as well, where it starts. Uh, maybe a question for you, Lexi. Do you think that employee engagement should be part of the hiring process? And and, and uh, if if yes, then, then how should it be part of the hiring process for people? Yeah, I'll answer that one, uh, Charlotte, but then I've got two other things that I just want to add on surveys as well. So um, should it be part of the hiring process? Well, it depends how you define your employee engagement. At, like at, at what point do you want to start building commitment and trust and what does that look like? And in the hiring process, I think, you know, we could all take a punt and go, yeah, it should be involved in the hiring process because that's when you first start building a trusting relationship with the person who's going to be in your business. Um, it's a lot about expectation setting, communicating transparently. And these are all things that you need to have in place if you're going to get employees to disclose things to you that will help you better engage them when they work for you. So it is really crucial that you have this link up and sense of continuity, a sense of clear expectation around the 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 level of uh, transparency, trust and, and accountability that the business has for making sure the employee feels comfortable and included. So um, that's my answer to your direct question, but I also just wanna circle back quickly. I know Robin and Andrew have both talked about surveys um, and I would, I would say like, that's what we hear a lot when people are trying to run listening activities in their business, a survey is a really easy way to do it. And it doesn't really matter how deep your pockets are. There are always ways of running surveys, but I would just say, uh, so when we look at startups and scale ups, it's a really low barrier to access way to start listening to your employees is to create your own survey. You can do it for free with just a little bit of time in creating a survey. And there are loads of great templates out there. Um, we've got some in our open playbook that can help you start to ask questions to understand how your employees are feeling. But I'd also just like to mention that something that we do hear from companies that are trying to encourage their employees to disclose information about their level of engagement is that it can sometimes be hard to encourage higher disclosure rates um, if it's something new that you're doing and if it's in-house and you haven't done it before. So I think there's a benefit to just shouting out that sometimes using a third party platform to understand in a first instance what is going on to establish a baseline is not a bad thing because sometimes it can help initiate the practice in your business of collecting this kind of information in a way where that data is separated and not being looked at by say the HR person who signs up for a promotion or a pay rise or something like that. So there are benefits to the nature of how you do a survey or a listening activity, depending on the particular type of problem that you might expect to see with your workforce, wherever you are in the journey of starting a listening process. 
Yeah, absolutely. And uh, uh, also completely agree on what you're saying. Like employee engagement is not something that we you could start without any budget. So indeed, a budget should never be an excuse to not work on it. And uh, uh, it's interesting what you're saying about third party uh, perspective indeed, because you can imagine that it makes people feel a bit more like, hey, okay, there's an external party objective going to look at the data. So really fair point. You mentioned something about a playbook. Um, uh, I'm going to make sure that people receive that. If you can maybe send it over to me after the webinar, then uh, people have some inspiration maybe to get started. Yep, it's on our website for free and anyone can access it. So um, I'll send that out. Ah, cool. Great, great. Hey, uh, Robin, you, of course, uh, help a lot of companies with hiring. Uh, I touched up on the topic already uh, a couple of minutes ago. Uh, should employee engagement be part of hiring? I definitely think it should. But how do you do that? Because you take an, you you uh, are an external party. You get inside of the company and you're going to help them with hiring. How do you advise them to include this component in the hiring process? And how do you execute it yourself as well? Yeah, it's, it's a really good point. Um, I, I think what we try and do is, is make sure it is it is part of our very very first conversation with clients who may be looking to to use the Spinks business. Um, and we do, we ask that question very much, you know, what are they, what are their, we want to know what their vision, their value, the purpose of their business is, because this is what our candidates want to know. They, they, of course, they're interested in, you know, the financial package, what the technology they may be working with, where, you know, but actually now there's a lot more that comes into this when they're making decisions around where they're going to be working. Um, and we're seeing it happen more and more that they're generally interested in, what this company stands for you know what is that purpose of that organization so we make it really really a, a key focus of when we're talking about you know the job description and, and what they're looking for out of the uh, for this candidate we're equally asking well what is in it for the candidate to take these jobs you know um it, it really needs to be a two-way conversation around that um and, th and there seems to be a lot of willingness from 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 many founders and and you know talent teams that we speak to on this and we do get a little bit more we have another brand of ours which is our on-site solution where we physically sit on site with startups and really help them scale and that's where we can really add, i think even more value charlotte that's where we really get involved with the hiring managers with the ceo and really get to understand their business because we're physically well i say physically with covid permitting we're physically sitting on site with them on a daily basis and understanding that so that's how we support and, th and then we make sure that we are speaking to the candidates ab about that you know it's really really important that we are aligning the candidates from a technology perspective and a job perspective but also really much from a from a culture perspective as well uh, and i think that helps with the retention as well yeah definitely uh and i think uh, i think it's a really good point uh mental well-being is a very important component of employee engagement but it's also definitely the, the value alignment that you believe in the same purpose of the company uh, and I think, by the way, there are also a lot of companies that um, still have the mindset that candidates need to sell themselves during a hiring process. Uh, well, I personally really believe in the importance of you also selling your value, your purpose in a, a fair way, of course. You shouldn't overpromise or uh, overdo that. Uh, but Andy, how are you doing that in your own hiring process? Because you, of course, uh, I think you are with around 45. 250 people now so you've, you've you've made a couple of hires already how, how do you do this um we are still reasonably old school we're um so all of the senior team will uh make sure that they interview an employee we look at um we look at making sure that the cultural fit is uh as tight as possible so we look to to make sure that they get a full rounded uh, process and in, in the interview process. We're lucky. I mean, we're working in uh, mental health, so we are one very much at the forefront. But we have a social cause. Our you know our mission is to increase the mental well being of society percent by percent, and people can really buy into that mission. And we can talk to them about how we achieve that, the technology that we deploy what we do in front of clients and we find that people will automatically engage with what we are doing and we look for that we are looking for people who want to come on the journey with us we often talk about passion um, for 
the subject, passion for helping people and for understanding. And so if, if you kind of feel that in, in that candidate, then we know that, that we'll work well together. Um, so, so we are somewhat lucky because because we can we can talk about our our mission and we can see if there's a connection there and that tends to be how we do it you know we we are definitely still a startup so everybody gets to do a, a little bit of everything and and um and so you need you need a little bit of resilience i think when you work for a for a startup and um, because life is not as regimented as as perhaps it is in a bigger organization you've got to be more dynamic you've got to be more flexible and and if if you've got passion for the subject then actually you don't mind doing some of those things so that's kind of how we 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 approach it of course we have psychologists on staff so um we get a little bit of insight into the candidates through that as as well because they're naturally um sort of talking to people and, and thinking about them uh, as part of the interview process so um, not that I'd suggest that you have clinical psychologists uh, involved in your recruitment process. We just happen to have it as a matter of course because they're part of our senior team. Yeah, and that definitely helps. It does I, help. um, I have a question that is completely off the script. We didn't discuss this uh, up front, um, but it, it came up when you were mentioning, of course, we are a mental well being, so people feel very much aligned with what we do already when they apply. Uh, I think. Here at Equality, my company is also in a sort of luxury position because we started this company with, well, our mission statement is we want to shape the world of unbiased hiring, make sure that everyone gets an equal opportunity to get hired. And I think as a result of that, that automatically attracts a lot of people uh, that are very purpose driven. Uh, and it, it also results in the fact that we have a very tight team and that everyone is so aligned with what we are doing as a company that that's some sort of automatically maybe covers one component of employee engagement. Do you guys think, and I'm going to leave it open, Louis is going to answer it, uh, that employee engagement can be easier or harder if you, if there's, for example, a societal impact uh, component to your company, or if your company has a very clear uh, purpose-driven mission versus maybe a company that is, uh, well, I'm not going to provide any examples, by the way. You know what I mean, I think. Um, I'd love to jump in on this one because um, focusing on what Tech Planet Charter does, we're, we're a diversity and inclusion organisation. So we're a mission driven organisation and we yeah. help other organisations improve their diversity. And in tech, um, one of the key lenses is, is, is women in tech. There are fewer women in tech than compared to almost any other baseline that you would look at where women are. So um, we often have organisations querying, well, how do we how do we attract more women? How do we engage more women so that we can hire them? Um, and there are differences. So to answer your question, Charlotte, like mission is really important, but it depends who you're trying to engage. So there are some really interesting pieces of research. The Institute of Coding did a piece with KPMG, I think, um, which showed that uh, women and girls are far more um, likely to be influenced in their job choices if you are talking about your mission and your societal impact. Um, so that's just one example, but there are lots of studies that show different facets of how to engage people differently and there's there's another one actually that's just come out very recently uh, by we are the we are the city and they surveyed women working in tech and found that the biggest influencer was salary which is what you would hope but the second one which was almost exactly the same percentage score was um having an engaged manager so the ways that you look at engagement really influence the types of uh, they can really influence different types of people so depending on what your talent strategy looks like and what your priorities are that can be a super interesting avenue to explore yeah and this is a really important point lexi around management and so we look at uh, and, and measure kind of holistic mental health but we also look at it from the point of view of a of a company and we know people leave managers they tend not to leave companies and so uh, we do a lot of education. We actually have an online course that is about ma mental health for managers, how to kind of really understand that because that holistic piece, everybody brings their whole self to work and take their whole self home again. And sometimes that's just through the door or sometimes actually just sat on the same couch. So that sort of uh, that distance between home and, and work has, uh, has collapsed in, in a lot of places. 
but it's the, the this notion of equality we work with a lot of uh, diversity and inclusion teams really because we're able to look at the data and and show um if you have any sort of issues you can highlight that data but that management piece is so critical to to engagement if your manager couldn't be bothered then pretty much is the you know the team his or, or, or her team are not going to be bothered either yeah yeah i completely agree and uh, i really like the training component that you do for managers as well it's something that we for example also do with our platform so mm. you can buy the platform but as a part of the onboarding we mm. Well, we give managers a training on unconscious bias and how can you make sure that you reduce that in an interview and etc. cetera. Uh, because we see that a lot of the companies that we work for also have very young managers, uh, so they're less experienced with this topic. So I think that making sure that the managers are aligned and, and, and educated is super important. Do you see, uh, uh, Robin, again, because yeah, you work with a lot of young companies. Mm. Um, do you see this being an issue often? that, that uh, young teams, young managers are, are less experienced in this topic. It's exactly that. And, and, it, and it's, it's just less experience because as I say, they're potentially, you know, they are, they are younger in their managerial career. So is that less experience? So yeah, we absolutely do have a focus actually around engaging with the managers to make sure that they feel that they are properly equipped to conduct those interviews. Because again, in, interviews are never something that people actually put on part of the job description typically you know is it something that happens to them and typically they don't get any training around that so they go in with maybe seems to have someone else is interviewed and just copying their traits and that is necessary isn't necessarily the right way to be conducting those interviews so we definitely do quite a bit of work around those elements especially when we notice it during the process and and you're actually absolutely right Lexi that point around or Andrew, I don't know if you said but people leave managers rather than companies we see the same when hiring people will choose those hirings not necessarily also the company on on that person who's hiring them and that manager can i work with that individual does that person you know do i am i inspired by that individual does that put you know and that side of things and they make those decisions on on that basis yeah and, and just really going back to your other point charlotte about the societal impact i think it's too easy to just say yeah if you're a company that is a tech for good or, or, or in that societal impact thing, that it's much easier than to, to hire. I, I still think it's about the people within those businesses and what they are, what how they believe they're doing right by their employees. Yeah, absolutely. I, uh, I fully agree. Hey, um, we um, uh, talked a lot about hiring and I think uh, a topic that I also want to discuss is onboarding as a next step then. Um, what we, for example, do here at Leap Falls here is we have uh, three stages of our onboarding and we don't necessarily say, hey, within X weeks, you need to be finished with your onboarding, but we have, we give you three milestones and you can take as much time as you want to complete those milestones. And the first milestone is always getting to know the company and the team, the why behind what we are doing uh, and to make sure that the alignment is there from the first week. And that's just an example of how we are doing it. But I'm, I'm very curious, um whether you guys have any best practices or learnings because you are onboarding a lot of people yourself as well uh, in your organizations what are you doing to make sure that from day one people feel that employee engagement is an important topic i i can take that initially so um i'll talk about from our perspective and i'll talk to you a bit about from our, our clients perspective so we do a, a week long onboarding strategy. Um, we make sure that they meet with as many people as we feel are right from a Sphinx perspective to make sure they really get a, a feel for us. We do that through the interview process. So a lot of it is just then meeting these people again as they're onboarding. But we also do it from a group perspective as well. Um, so we really make sure they understand their role, where they fit within our business, but also where our business then fits within the group. So they get a really clear understanding of that. We do a lot also at their onboarding stage. Um, they get a, a kind of a, a handbook where we talk about, you know, our vision of our values, but also they get the career pathways in that in that handbook as well. So they can really see straight away that we are thinking from day one, not just their passing their probation, but actually what happens past probation. Where do they? How does their career evolve with it within our organisation? But I would say it's evolving. I don't think we're perfect at it. Um, I think it is it, a continuous learning process. 
and from our clients perspective i think one of the dangers is a lot of companies think a lot more now about hiring they're much more aware of unconscious bias at the hiring stage but that needs to be carried through into the onboarding stage as well and i think that still isn't there completely at the moment in my opinion yeah what do you, what do you see that goes wrong there I think from some of the some of the companies that I think we, we we've engaged with, I think they think a lot about unconscious bias because they are they're kind of told to think about it at the hiring stage, and it's very very important to help attract that talent. And then it's not always matched within those organisations. And and a lot of startups, I understand that you know they are challenged in so many different ways. Andrew, you talked about how many different hats these people have to wear. It is you've got to be really passionate and really involved to, to want to you know, jump into that. So I think sometimes that employee engagement piece can get a little bit lost during the actual the onboarding and then they're there and they suddenly feel that that's not exactly what they had during the hiring process and there's that disconnect. And, you know, there's obviously that very well known stat that, you know, the majority of people, if they're going to leave a business, they leave in those first three months. They really are challenged in those first three months. And that's what I consider to be the onboarding. I don't see onboarding just being you know your first week i actually see that onboarding really been a, a longer period of time of that so i think that's where <clears throat> companies need to still do more yeah i think there's a real there's some real dynamics around onboarding happening now uh, you've got to look at the individual um is this their first job or do they have 30 years of experience um we were doing a study around first workers with with uh, a lot of the bigger organizations unfortunately the pandemic hit and uh, we were not able to continue that work. But what we understand is that when you leave a university and go to work for the first time, that's a that's a massive um, change. You're suddenly going to find that your salary doesn't nearly go as far as you thought it was. Um, and there's all sorts of pressures. You might be away from home for the first time. So we want to look at the individual and their, their circumstances. Um, around that we also now are looking at well if you're working from home we took on people that we didn't meet face to face for nine months uh you know so you've got to look at them are they, are they working at home or are they living on their own um so do how do they need you know what kind of support should you need to get get for those individuals so we want to look at them in terms of their individual circumstances because that's going to allow you to engage with them a lot more that's going to allow you to show that that you you're building that trust you're you're showing that you're understanding them as an individual so it's not we don't see it as here's our onboarding process we want to take more of an individualistic look at that and to say okay let's understand that individual and, and, and move that and move that forward that that's how we're approaching it but we're a much smaller organization so we can do that because we can because that's scalable for us you know we're not we're not the size of of uh, of robin's organization no that's a fair point hey i see one question coming um in the chat and after that i would like to move on to the last topic as we have 15 minutes left um but yolanda is uh, saying and thanks for uh, um putting in the question Yolanda uh, the first month seems to be the highest risk for engagement of employees uh, because employees want to experience a match with their expectations created in the hiring phase in my opinion the onboarding process needs three months at least what does the panel think of that now I, I do have an opinion myself as well but I would like to hear your opinions first um, I guess for us it's sort of um well, is it is there a line between onboarding and and kind of and working? The the reality is that from day one you're learning, and I think that you should always be learning on the job. Um, you have to learn a lot more during the onboarding because you've got some basic things that you need to put in place. But uh, I think three months, yeah, sure. Um, actually, making sure that you follow up or you do skip level one-on-ones where you can try and figure out, make sure that, that that person remains connected to the mission and the vision and that they've had the kind of experience. So um, absolutely, it, it, 
there are some things that you need to do. So the administration of onboarding and the basics of onboarding. But then I think actually you're into this constant learning. I also think sometimes organizations, at least the onboarding process is maybe to, to make that person think a bit more like the organization. Whereas I've always taken approach that when you bring someone new into the organization, it's an enormous opportunity for the organization to learn from the individual. So the organization should become a bit more like that individual that they've just brought on board, as opposed to trying to make that person like you. That, that's not why you hired them in the first place. You act, At least for us, we want their experience, we want their talent, we want their thinking, and therefore we don't want to say, oh, well, this is actually how you do it, because they may come up with a much better idea. So. Um, I think for the question, sure. I think, yeah, much longer time, and it's about constant learning on the on the job. Yeah. Well, my personal view on this is I um, I don't know if I'm a big fan of putting some sort of a timeline on onboarding because I I think onboarding goes at a bit again. We are also a small organization, so we can afford doing it like that like that. But some of our employees take uh, a much longer time for onboarding than others do. So I think it's more about what we want people to get out of it and let them choose their own uh, pace and how they're doing it. And um, I think it's also important to keep in mind that employee engagement, of course, doesn't stop after the onboarding. So I think that that, uh, that transition is also a fair one to, uh, to keep in mind. Um, although I find it a very important and relevant topic, I did want to cover one other topic. And uh, I also see one question from you or two coming up in the chat. So we're going to answer that in a bit. Uh, but Lexi, especially since you're in the panel also today, um, people are writing a lot more about uh, diversity, equality, and inclusion in relation to employee engagement. Um, what would you say is the impact of, of diversity and equality and inclusion on, on this topic? Um, it's a really interesting one. I think there's a bit of a, a circle, a, well, a cycle really that exists here between employee engagement and diversity and inclusion. Um, something that's really top of my mind at the moment is that the Tech Tank Charter is about to release our annual diversity and tech report. So we've got sort of 600 companies that have shared this data with us that is not usually available around diversity and inclusion in their businesses, which includes loads of rich data around what they're doing to actually engage their employees. And um, something that we keep hearing coming up is that companies want to understand and hear more from their employees about how they feel and, and what can be done better to engage them. And uh, data and disclosure rates are a huge issue. Um, lots of companies do have trouble getting this information from their employees. And the problem is that the employees that don't answer are the ones that you really want to hear from uh, more than anything. So um, there's this kind of circular thing where if we're trying to look at this link between diversity and inclusion, you can't you can't really assess that very easily unless you have good employee engagement and employees that are to go back to what I said at the very beginning, are, are, are trusting enough in the organization mm -hmm. to share personal information about themselves, about their identity and about how they feel. So there, there's, there's a huge issue with just being able to measure, you know, what is what is even going on? Where do we start? Um, unless you are working on employee engagement, and that's part of the culture of your business. Um, but then when people then come to look at diversity and inclusion in terms of, well, what can we do as a business to improve that? Engagement is just, again, another thing that comes up time and time again about listening to your employees, understanding what they think and feel. Do they feel they're treated fairly? Is there flexibility that meets their needs? Um, you know, do they have good career development? Is there good promotion and retention opportunity for them? You know, is it a safe work environment? So all of these things feed back into this idea of employee engagement. I think the two things are really inseparable. Yeah, no, no doubt. Um... I think this is really important. We, as I say, we do a lot of, of work around this. We find that uh, so we, uh, our assessment is a, is a sort of a health, a well-being assessment. So we, we see different data. But one of the things that we do is one, of course, privacy and the fact that we're often separate from the organization. That, that is a big thing. So you establish that, that, that trust. Um, we know we have aggregation, we have all sorts of uh, ethical use of data policies, lots of things around that um, piece. But one of the things that we actually find works is we talk about how your data is, is able to do good for 
for the general population, you know, research. This is about actually helping improve not just the workplace, but but society's understanding of these issues. And when people understand actually, ah, okay, I'm helping, my data can really help, and I understand that my privacy is never going to be used against me, then we we certainly see much higher rates of um, of engagement because we talk about it in how they uh, not just are gaining benefit themselves, but how the wider population is is benefiting. And generally, people, most people want to help. Most people, are, are, uh, as long as it's not going to do them harm. So that, that's kind of how we approach it. Great, thank you. Uh, Robin, sorry, you wanted to add something, I think? You uh, only need to uh, get the mute button there. Uh... Okay. There we go. <laughs> the dog was barking in the background, so apologies. <laughs> um, I, I, no, I, I completely agree. I, I, it's DE and I are absolutely integral parts of, of our culture, and we've actually, yeah, you know, we are in a fortuitous position, being part of a bigger group that we've been able to bring, you know, people in specifically to focus a, around that uh, because it is such an important part, a component. But I think that was it comes from the top down. Our, our group CEO it, it is absolutely integral to her um that we think this way um and she ensures that it's installed in her leadership team and then and then through us to all parts of, of the business um and i think it's all about celebrating we do a lot about celebrating our differences as well as our similarities and i think that's a big part of it as well and and we do we, we do have metrics around it you know one of the metrics that we use is you know i feel that i could be my true self in the workplace and that's such a powerful message to be able to get across. And, and you know, we're, 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 in a, we're in a good place. We're not in a perfect place. I think it's about 75% of the people feel they can, but that's still one quarter of our global um, team that feel they can't. So that's definitely work to be done. Um, and I think from our clients' perspective, the startups and scale-ups, I, I think a lot want to do much more around diversity, equality and inclusion. And we're seeing that happen a lot more. We, ha we have a brand within Spinks called You Equal Tech, which we actually work with our clients around encouraging to kind of attend events. You know, again, this is pre-COVID, but hopefully we, we can return to that. Um, where we, we talk about building diverse and inclusive working environments. Uh, so, I th so I think those are, those are important parts as well. Um, I would just add, though, that I feel still you still feel with some startups, they are challenged in this space. They are challenged in this space because they are trying to do so much. And obviously, I think they fundamentally want to do more, but it's challenging as they as they as they scale very quickly. Yeah, I uh, I completely agree. Um, a woman, I think there's uh, one question in the chat that is uh, a question that you uh, can answer best, and that's a question from Arthur, and he is asking if you would have to point out one main bottleneck that startups usually face from a hiring perspective, what would it be? Wow, well, one bottleneck. Um, <laughs> I, I think the interview process it is a big bottleneck. I think sometimes uh, companies delve too much on, on that area and they don't think about the simplicity of that. Um, and I think in that respect, what they do is quite often people look to identify people that are similar to themselves rather than think about bringing talent in that is actually different to them. And we talk about culture add quite a lot rather than, you know, and I think that's a really important bit. So I think that is that is a bottleneck. It's educating those managers around hiring and not looking to hire replicas of themselves but to bring talent that comes with a, a lot more th than that yeah i uh, I, I completely agree <laughs> hey uh we have five minutes left um i always uh, like to end a webinar in a very practical way some some things that the people can take away after the conversation and that maybe they can start implementing already tomorrow to do something uh to work on employee engagement to improve it if you all would have to give the audience one or if you really can't pick two tips on what they can do to improve their employee engagement uh, and something that maybe they can start doing already tomorrow what would it be 
Uh, you know, I'll. Um, it's an obvious one, but but you, it, it's around communication, uh, and I've never worked in an organisation uh, through any sort of engagement surveys where communication has not come up as a constant topic, and it's a really fine line because it's very difficult. Um, it, it, it's impossible to have everybody to know about everything, but everybody wants to know about everything because we're human beings and, you know, and, and we we want to do that. So having the right communication channels, making sure also that those communication channels come right back into the C-suite. Um, so thinking about your communication and are you communicating well, particularly now if you've got large people in hybrid models are working from home and you may not necessarily have changed your communication strategy, but you've no longer got people meeting in the kitchen or chatting around the water cooler or, or, or whatever it happens to be. Because if people feel communicated to and they feel like they're in the know, then they can engage a lot, a lot better. So it's about making sure that if the structure of your business has changed, um, then make sure you reflect that in in your communication. Um, that that that's one. Yeah, a really important one, especially I think in this. Uh, I want to say post COVID area, but we are not in post yet. Uh, but at least in the hy uh, hybrid models, uh, extremely important to uh, almost over communicate. I think. Uh, Le Lexi, would you want to uh, take over? Yeah, I would say there are things that you can always start doing straight away to improve employee engagement, but you won't finish them quickly. So that's the first thing I would say is manage your own expectations about doing the prep work. If you get the groundwork right for hiring, for engagement, anything like that, your onboarding, then you will have a resource that you can reuse and it's worth investing the time upfront to be really thoughtful and considered and, and intentional about how you're going to start undertaking engagement activity, whatever that means. Um, the second thing um, that I would say around it really is you have to establish measures. So you have to work out what it is engagement means to you. How are you going to measure it? What is an appropriate proxy for that? Um, so that's all going to be part of your planning and consideration for how you start work on engagement activity. Um, and then the third tip I'll just give is that when you come to actually start taking action around the plans that you make, a practice of humility is really helpful in this area. It is fast changing, new best practices emerging all the time and invariably all businesses will will um, try to walk a very, very difficult and, and, and vague line around what's the right thing for them. So whatever you're doing, position it with transparency to your employees and position it with humility such that you can say to them, we are doing our best to walk this balance line. And I'm sure that we might make mistakes at some point, but when we do, we want to hear so that we can correct. And I think humility helps a lot of people to start the engagement process with you. Absolutely. Thanks. I think from my perspective, I mean, what Alexia and Andrew said, I, I really, really do echo. Uh, communication is so, so key uh, part of, of it. And I think that sometimes it's fundamentally where it falls down. Um, the one other thing I would just add is I think, employees being recognized for their success i don't think that always happens as much and that needs to happen more um so we do we do a really a big part around that and making sure that our employees and, and they're recognized globally so they share that success success around all the different different geographies the different brands within the group as well and i think that works really well yeah i think that's right and charlotte if i can just add because i, I think lexi brought up a really important point around measurement because measurement makes you accountable and accountability as a senior team is incredibly important if you don't hold yourselves accountable well what's the point in doing it so you need to you need to show how you're going to be accountable and measurement obviously uh, uh, dear to my heart but uh, you know lexi talked about that very eloquently measurement is so critical because it's uh, that is about accountability and as leaders we must be accountable Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think it's it's super relevant. We are uh, we have someone in our advisory board who's very much focused on um, uh, HR and hiring practices within within scale ups, and uh, we are working with her on some sort of an NPS kind of model. Like, how can we make sure that we always have an NPS of how happy our employees are, and also where uh, what things are going well and what might be improved? And I think that's indeed very important to set some sort of a a baseline for yourself, a target, this is what I want to go to and make sure that you keep measuring it indeed. Um, so very fair point. 
Hey, it's um, uh, well here in Netherlands. It's uh, 1 p.m. Uh, so that means uh, we've reached the end of this webinar. I really want to thank you for all the insights. Uh, I've learned a lot myself as well. Uh, and we are in the middle of hiring our very first people and culture managers. So there are a lot of very cool insights that I'm going to take with me. So thanks for that. Um, for everyone um, who is listening to this webinar, if you have any questions still for one of us, uh, we are all like, active on LinkedIn. So feel free to reach out. Uh, you will also get the recording of this webinar uh, in a bit uh, so that you can check it out again. Uh, and again, uh, thanks very much, guys, for being here today with me. Thank you. Thank you, Charlotte. Bye-bye. Ciao. Cool.